So uh, today's topic is on taboo, so let's get going. Do you want to speak to the first? If I said no, is that an option? No. Okay. Then yes, I'd be happy to speak. Thank okay. you. <laughs> um, so when I think about taboos in Judaism, um, first of all, what I should say is that there's like a lot of different opinions in Judaism, and it's very hard to have one definitive opinion to say that this is the Jewish opinion on anything, um, because there is a joke um, that basically goes, you know, if there's you know, four Jews in a room, that means that there's at least eight opinions, um, which is pretty accurate. Um, so when I speak about taboos or really anything else, um, I want everybody to remember that what I'm speaking from is generalizations um, and also from my perspective on it um, and knowing that you could talk to um, Rabbi Stoller or Cantor Shermit or any other Jewish clergy or just Jewish person in the world um, who are, who's knowledgeable about the subject and they may have a different opinion or a different read or a different take on, on any given subject because um, to me that's the beauty of Judaism is that there's so many different interpretations and so many um, different ways of looking at it. So I will share with you what my read on a certain situation is and be happy to answer questions from my perspective um, with the knowledge that I do not speak for every Jew, nor would I even want to speak for every Jew. <laughs> um, so one of the taboos that um, we had talked about a little bit um, was this idea about alcohol and, and Judaism, um, because it's a really difficult subject. Um, you know, and on one hand, it's part of our rituals. It's part of, um, <coughs> excuse me, it's part of our rituals when we um, bless our Shabbat, you know, our, our Shabbat traditional blessings. We have candles, wine, and motzi, which is the challah. Um, when we have, when we bless different holidays, we, we say a blessing over the wine because it's supposed to be this um, sweet, you know, joyful peace. And so um, in Psalms, it says that wine gladdens the heart. That's how we, you know, we read it. And so as we say different blessings over it, when we say the blessing over wine on Shabbat, it's supposed to remind us of the sweetness of Shabbat, um, that it's a holiday that we celebrate, it's a holiday that we are supposed to um, refresh and renew our souls, Shabbat Vayina Fash. And one of the ways that we do that is by celebrating the joy of the holiday, whether it's Shabbat or something else. And so as we think about wine, as we think about alcohol, there are different times in the Jewish calendar where we have alcohol as part of our celebration. We have um, on Passover, we have a Seder, and during that Seder, we have four different glasses of wine. Um, and then we have different pieces of um, parts of our celebrations of Purim and other holidays where we, you know, drink until, you know, we are drunk at some point. But that's a taboo because we also have to weigh that with the knowledge that not everybody is comfortable having alcohol. Not everybody um, should be you know, imbibing in those things. And it's also a health issue for many people. And so how do we um, wrap our heads around the idea that you know, we are supposed to have this as part of the joy and part of the celebration of our holidays and also be mindful that there are alternatives and other ways to celebrate and gladden the heart that have nothing to do with alcohol. And so we, we replace that because it's actually the blessed thing in Judaism is about um, the grape, the fruit of the vine. And so it's actually perfectly acceptable um, to have grape juice instead of, instead of wine. And so as we think about taboos, we think about ways that we can, um, that we can expand our thinking so that we can include and be inclusive of everyone in our community. And we began actually with something called Wesley Pub. And in the United Methodist tradition, I'm a United Methodist clergy person, and uh, again, there's a diversity of voices. There are probably some voices who think I'm not a Christian or shouldn't be a pastor, so there's that taboo. But um, in terms of alcohol and in terms of consumption of alcohol, Methodists are historically teetotalers. And um, we're very connected with the Women's Christian Temperance Union at a, very, at, at a point in history. And if you go to old Methodist churches, you'll likely see a window that's dedicated in honor of the Women's Christian Temperance Union. 
And while the Book of Discipline, this really great, fantastic book for inviting you to rest easy at night and sleep, uh, it's not explicitly uh, a problem, but there's this kind of historic resonance, right, that most Methodist pastors respect. And so a few years ago, we started something downtown called Herb, uh, Wesley Pub, which everybody invite, was invited to bring the beverages of their choice, uh, acknowledging that not every ministry is for everyone at every point in their journey. Alcoholics Anonymous was meeting at the same time as we were uh, somewhere else. And so we gathered and we had these conversations and they grew enough that the bishop got some notice, uh, a, little, a few notes from folks in town. And so when I went to visit with her, I, I named, you know, that we were, that it was pretty tame for the most part. It was a, a space for conversation. Diverse conversations were happening. And, um, and she brought up the Women's Christian Temperance Union. And, and so our next Wesley Pub, we were able to toast them and their, <laughs> and their work for inclusion uh, and their work for care of families and that kind of intention that we can share with them but to acknowledge that there can be a safe space for moderation and conversation uh, that could invite everybody to the table and help folks uh, be present with each other without sort of the harsh expectations of walking into a church. My turn. Good evening. Uh, salam, everybody. This is Imam Jamal. Sh Shalom Aleichem. Did I say it good? Good. Um, just a comment if you couldn't find uh, Dina or Brian or Arye you can just call me and I will fit properly you know to answer all your questions <laughs> yeah. so the topic today is about <laughs> double as Imam Jamal right the topic today is about <laughs> about tattoos right tattoos <laughs> That's what you ailed, emailed me. Tattoos are great too. No, you, you can talk you about said tattoos. tattoos. So I was prepared for tattoos, not for tattoos. Here, here we are. Uh, we are live. I'm embarrassed. I'm prepared for. So. Okay, full stop, start from the beginning. <laughs> um, so, uh, tapuz. God created, no, don't try, don't even try to <laughs> attempt to raise anyone. I'm, I'm done from last time. <coughs> um, God created, again, created this beautiful universe, including human being. And when they were created, everything in their transaction and life was open and free and allowed and then he starts sending them messengers or let's say teachers in order to teach them how to live happily and peacefully and with that now the concept of tattoos i will add it here to say tattoos are things that only god in his scriptures from our is islamic perspective what he said not to do or stay away for the sake of the benefit of those human beings, whether it is physically, whether it is emotionally, um, a human interaction, uh, uh, everything surrounding that single human being to live properly and happily, this is what we understand tattoos. So tattoos are not man-made, it is God-made in his scriptures. Now, one of those or some of those are the alcohol uh, prohibition, for example, uh, pork, uh, uh, kind of dietary uh, uh, restriction. Uh, tattoos is another one, and, and others. So I'm just giving some of those uh, introduction in order just to refresh your mind to ask me the questions after that. Good. <laughs> add, it, add it to my next one. <laughs> yes, there you go. <coughs> okay, so now we will open the floor up for any questions from the audience in regards to taboos in our religious tradition. So does anybody have a question now, or I have a few that I can get us going?
I would say no. I would I would just say no. <laughs> Full stop. Yeah. I mean, maybe I d Santa is whoever I don't know. The Repeat the question. Somebody on uh, uh, somebody on Fox News <laughs> was saying. Or some was television saying, program. <laughs> I'm on. Improvising. You know, <laughs> so somebody was saying Jesus was white, and Santa Claus was white. Is white. So my answer is so what. That's my. Uh, my uh, so what. Without going into any further racist kind of comments or clarification for somebody who is that much dipped in that mentality. So what. Let's move forward for the follow-up. I mean, uh, question on that one. Y you want more details? No, no, but, but uh, you know, when I grew up in New England, yeah. and when I went to the South, Southern States, uh, the black people lived in the red hair color. There's no white people in the black houses that I lived in. Hmm. He was Middle Eastern, okay? So regardless the way we want to uh, consider his skin, but that is really... It's not a discussion, it's not an issue at all. So my answer to him will be, so what? What do you want to get from that? You wanna live with that uh, icon in your mind that he was uh, white, okay. What else? So heaven is just for you and Jesus is just for you and so many other answers. But I don't wanna go into that with him. I would say, okay, so what? We have another question from the audience. Hi. So I will say that in, in terms of Judaism, divorce has never been prohibited, um, really. Um, divorce has never been prohibited in Judaism. Um, and in fact, uh, we have a marriage document that people sign at their weddings called a ketubah, um, which outlines responsibilities. And originally, that document really started um, as a contract. that It was exchange of money between um, a father usually and the, um, and the spouse and the husband um, and the things that the woman was bringing into the marriage um, and therefore what would like if needed what would the woman be therefore able to keep upon leaving a marriage um, it was actually you know we look at it now as kind of outdated because it's not egalitarian at all it treats women like property um, lots of problems but in its time it was actually very progressive um, because it, pr it allowed women to have some sort of income should they get divorced. It allowed for protection for women so that they would be taken care of if they were ever to be divorced. Now, um, in traditional Judaism, um, and this may be what, you, what you're thinking about, women are not allowed to file for divorce. It has to be a man who files for divorce. That is not something that is in the liberal traditions. And in fact, um, the conservative movement and the reform movement have um, language in the ketubas, if, if, that you're, if you're still having that kind of contractual language that allows a woman to, to file for divorce. Um, but in the traditional world, it's still a very real problem where women are trapped in marriages because their husband will not give them divorces. But um, as a whole, that has not ever been something that has been um, unable to be done in Judaism and is, in fact, very um, progressive in its mindset that women, should there be a divorce, are well taken care of. 
Uh, I would speak to that. I, I am actually a divorced clergy person. or I'm currently married, but I have been divorced. Um, I married my high school sweetheart. That was not a great idea to pick the person that you were spending the rest of your life with when I was 16. Uh, and so we, uh, I went to college. The next week I graduated. I got married, and then we moved to Germany. And um, the, the, it was great to live in Germany for two and a half years, like optional, like great, great part of that time. Um, and it was really the healthiest thing for me in my life was uh, to have this divorce that I didn't want. It was, uh, I was sure that I would kind of die alone, a shell of myself. <laughs> and then I decided, uh, I had already felt called to go to seminary. I just kept putting it off and putting it off. And so finally I went and, um, and there are a lot of traditions where Christian clergy couldn't be divorced. Uh, I think when Jesus speaks to divorce or when the early Christians acknowledge divorce or express concern around it, it it's about the vulnerability of, of particularly of women and, and the impact of that divorce. And, and so I, I see the, those words in that light and that it should remind us to care for people who are vulnerable and that the, that the benchmark of our faith should be asking us about what is life-giving, what's life-giving for people and um, calling us towards that instead of really harsh absolutes that don't kind of aren't life-giving to everybody in every situation. Well, uh, I haven't been divorced. I have never divorced. I am not going to divorce. <laughs> I, I'm not planning on that again. Just it so. is <laughs> and I've never been in Germany. <laughs> yeah, no, no. That's a good way to start with. So divorce is, is allowed in Islam, but it is like the last card that the one of the couples may bring out when uh, life between both of them comes to a dead end. We do our best, and that's from the Quranic teaching even, that to have to reconcile or have kind of mediation uh, time after time. Uh, try to reason things, try to keep that holy family continuing as much as possible. But when uh, it is really dead end, well, it is allowed and it can be done by the male, it can be done by the female. Both are taken from the Quran. Uh, culturally, men have, Muslim men have abused that power. But even from the Quran, there is also a way for the woman, the wife, to take herself also out of that uh, uh, wedlock. So both can do that, but we do our best in our counseling to keep the family and teach about life is not 50-50. It is 51-49 sometimes. Somebody has to step a little bit down so the others can continue and vice versa. Unless uh, we have like life-threatening issues or, or really harsh kind of uh, treatment, then uh, yes, any, I don't remember in my 23 years ministry here in, in this country that I counseled couples who are really divorcing, but I did my best to bring them together. And if they really insist, then I will say, look for the legal uh, uh, exit, uh, I can do no more. Yep. Slip of tongue. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Never mind. We, we have not discussed politics. Um, we have discussed Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. So is what we're doing here right now taboo? I would love if somebody can drag me to a political discussion. I would love to go through that. <laughs> no? <laughs> speechless. I made her speechless. Okay. <laughs> yes, go ahead. Point one for Imam Jamal. Thank you, Dina. Um, I know I can always rely on you. Always. Thank you for your support. <laughs> um, 
you know, one of the things that I always go back to is in this video that we made for TriFaith, I think we unveiled it at Abraham's tent last year, um, Nuzat, who's a founding member of, of AMI, um, said, and I'm not going to say it as eloquently as she did, but she said something to the effect of, um, in polite company, you're not supposed to discuss politics and religion, but what we're saying then is that we can't have a full and meaningful relationship with everybody, um, and that's where TriFaith can come into the picture, is that we can have these full, meaningful discussions knowing that we're coming at it from a respectful dialogue and trying to understand each other, um, not to convince each other that our point of view is the right point of view, um, but that, I think, is one of the beautiful things about being in this community and being part of TriFaith is that um, we're affirming that those things can happen um, in real and meaningful, authentic relationships. I would add that a part of our cultural like literacy is if we don't practice having political conversations or intense or serious conversations of any nature, then, then we start to like lose our ability to do those things well and to practice them and to engage in them in a way that is, is hopefully connective instead of um, barrier building and, and pushing people apart. And, uh, I, I often go back to Brene Brown where she, she talks about knowing your boundaries on what, what kind of conversation you want to have and uh, being intentional about what you're willing to participate in and how that, that allows you to be more present and mo more whole wholehearted. Um, and that's not always easy. I have a, a really politically diverse family. Uh, and when I say politically diverse, I mean, I'm just by myself, but uh, <laughs> we've got a, a small major minority, it's growing. If someone would get married, it would help. Um, but those conversations can be really hard. And so I just go back to Brown and like the intention of how we have conversations and that I think it's, if we don't practice it together, um, it makes us less capable of engaging. Maybe they do want to go to Dan and Donna's. I think it's also food related, right? Yeah, yeah. so. Uh, um, so what I will say is that um, I recently actually had a, a neighbor to neighbor dinner myself. Um, we went to um, a family's house who, um, and like there was uh, you know one of us from each congregation, that's how this, this works. And we had a very open conversation via text message because that's how everybody communicates today about what our restrictions were. Um, and so I said, you know, we don't mix milk and meat. Um, and other people chimed in and said, okay, well that works for us because we don't do that either. And in fact, we only you know eat halal meat. And so every you know it's fine with everybody. And then we had a very open dialogue about what is um, okay with people. And so I, I would say in terms of how we interact with each other, openness is an expectation in TriFaith. So I think that we should be really open to hearing what people are comfortable with because if, if there's going to be some element of, of an event that makes a certain population feel like they're not welcome, then that defeats the purpose of what we're doing. So I think being able to speak openly about what your beliefs are and why you believe 
um, that and, and how you can make sure that you all feel comfortable. I think we should do our best to accommodate everybody's preferences. So that's how I would open it. Um, in terms of Jewish tradition, there are a lot of different rules and laws about food specifically. I spoke to wine a little bit already um, in saying that you know there's no prohibition about it. In fact, it's included in many of our religious traditions, but it is not at all required in terms of social gatherings. So we are open to being with or without alcohol, however the, the group sees fit. Um, in terms of food and um, eating, we traditionally don't mix milk and meat because it says in the Torah, you shall not boil a kid in its mother's milk. And it would take eternity to explain to you how it came from, went from there to the modern day laws of, of keeping kosher. But what I will say is that every Jew, especially in our community, will have a different interpretation of that. And so it's best to have open conversations about what their personal practices are um, in order to make sure people feel included and welcomed. Now, tri-faith is, uh, is a tri-faith, it's not mono-faith. And we have uh, our mission, and we have our vision, and we have those articles, one of them called the respect, you know, respect the other within the other. So the tri-faith, one of the agenda of the tri-faith is for people to learn about each other. Um, moving from <coughs> our standards and our comfort zone into joining and overlapping with the others. And during that kind of process, we need to understand that culture or that religion, whether we agree or disagree, in order to be able to live as neighbor and, and run this kind of activity. So uh, uh, being open, being respectful, being accommodative in that sense, and maybe you can have a kind of discussion with them about uh, why, if they have any way to explain about that. Now, alcohol is one of the strong taboos in, in, in Islam. And the simple reason why, again, I start with God said so. But when God said so, he made, he allowed us to enjoy and live with everything that bring good for us, health-wise, mental-wise, relationship-wise, everything. And when he forbade something, it's because of the side effect or the bad effects on our health, on our mind, our brain, and others. So alcohol comes under the drug category that close on the mind and does not <coughs> allow you to think freely and think properly. In addition to that, what has been discovered about the medical effects of, of alcohol on the liver and, and, and uh, to that one. So what you want to do is just uh, being open and request, do you have any uh, preferences so we can accommodate that? Shellfish is fine unless it is in certain culture, but the general teaching is fine. Uh, gelatin, the, the educated Muslims can go with gelatin because of the new theories that was proven that gelatin has been changed from uh, uh, lard or from the pork into a new substance, and that new material, new substance, took different characteristic and different name and cannot be reversed back. So based on that kind of theory, for those educated Muslims, and I follow that one, I don't have problem uh, having candies or others with gelatin. Now, do we have people who yet don't know about this or don't believe in this? Yes. So it is, an, again, is a kind of preference. Again, for the halal food is, is the same concept uh, for me. Um, <coughs> excuse me, I have a little bit of a cough. Um, in terms of Jewish tradition, it kind of goes back to what is kosher and what is not kosher. And um, they're pretty stark categories. And in the Torah, it outlines a number of different animals that are, are not kosher. One of those is pork, one is shellfish, um, along with other different kinds of animals, depending on like um, how they process their food, all of these different categorizations. Um, and from there, over the centuries, it's become 
interpreted and um, tried to make into a practice because what's in the Torah, generally speaking, oftentimes has to be interpreted and translated into how we live our modern lives. So there are um, councils, there are different um, bodies that certify something as kosher or not kosher. So people who um, do keep kosher will look for certain symbols on, um, on their foods to say whether this has been certified as kosher or not kosher. Things like jello, things like that contain gelatin um, are still not certified as kosher for the most part. There are alternatives, like you could find a marshmallow that is certified as kosher, but you have to look for it. It has certain symbols on it that will mark it as one or the other. Um, in terms of shellfish, it goes in the same category as pork in terms of what it's just a, a category of food that um, is considered unkosher. And so people who, as I said, will interpret things differently. Some will try and follow all of the laws of kashrut. Um, you know, for me personally, I don't eat pork and I don't eat shellfish. Um, as just That's my way of keeping kosher. Um, other people will interpret it how they see fit. That's part of what Reform Judaism means, is being able to look at the laws and traditions and find the ones that are meaningful for your Jewish practice. And so, again, it's about being open to having those conversations, like Imam Jabal was saying, and learn from the people that you're interacting with as part of this community to ask them what's meaningful for them. And you can even ask why they choose to have that practice. I think it's part of having this uh, way of getting to know each other. Yes, yes. Never, uh, not once. Well, we have tapus about again, God said so, about do, God said so, about don't, and we have a huge, big gray area where is left for a human interpretation based on their understanding to those texts and their geographic location and their context and condition. And sometimes the less educated uh, uh, Muslims will tend, since they don't know when they don't understand or they are not well educated, well versed with Islam, so try they try to be very protective by creating, by creating those taboos that no, 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 uh, just to keep themselves on the safe side. At the time, it is not no, it is not no, it is not no. So yes, we have sometimes when, when you are less educated with your own faith and religion, you may turn, you may tend to uh, create those taboos. And for Muslims, we have seen it through ISIS, through Al-Qaeda, through some other uh, uh, members. Uh, not to put down any Muslim individual, but all these kind of different interpretation is based on the lack of understanding the the right or the proper text, the verge, I mean the, the the scripture of the Quran and the teaching of the Prophet. And that's my answer if I understood the the question properly. Yep. I forgot the question. No, just um. What? I'm still working on changing some taboos in the Christian tradition myself, but uh, in the United Methodist context that I come from, uh, there's, there's been a number of spaces of, of change in how people practice. And uh, like in the 1950s, there was a, a great debate about whether women could be clergy, and, um, and then it, it passed. And, since then, we have become a global church where uh, the delegates are gathering. We have what I call Methodist Olympics. It happens every four years. And uh, the United Methodist Church grew up at the same time as, our, as the United States. And so our structure really follows the country in terms of you elect delegates. And it's about as easy to get something passed or changed as it is in our own Congress, except now it's like the UN because uh, about more than 50% of the vote comes from outside of the United States. Um, and so in terms of human sexuality right now, the great kind of crux of, disc of, crux of discussion is around inclusion. 
And um, if it was just an American vote, it would have passed 10, 15 years ago. Um, but it's a global vote. So that, that's sort of challenging to progressives in a way. Uh, and in the 90s, progressives were like, oh yeah, everybody come to the table and vote. And uh, now they're like, oh. But, um, and, and so I don't know what's, gonna, uh, what's happening next in terms of um, the larger context, but we, we are working around this conversation of full inclusion of folks. And uh, my context at Urban Abbey, we have been intentional from the very start. We're born that way. Uh, we are fully inclusive of everybody. And, um, but we're in this larger tension, which, which I have held intentionally uh, to keep, um, to be a part of pushing those norms and to be pushing those conversations in our context. Um, I think similar um, to you, uh, one of the boundaries that I think has been pushed and the taboos that have were pushed it has to do with gender inclusion. Um, the, you know, traditionally women could not be ordained as clergy in, um, in Judaism. And for hundreds of years, that's how it was. And it wasn't until um, 50 years ago that a woman was ordained as a rabbi. Her name was Sally Presian. She is a rabbi in New Jersey still. Um, and since then, there's been more and more inclusivity. And um, our traditions have to evolve based on that. Um, our prayer structure um, and our liturgy has evolved even. You know, And one of our prayers, we um, acknowledge the patriarchs of the religion. And in the reform movement, we include the matriarchs as well. So that's something that if you come in from a different movement of Judaism and you have no idea what you, what's going on, you'll hear the exact same prayer, but like with an extra line in it, which is surprising for people. Um, but you know, until 50 years ago, this wasn't um, a possibility. And the I believe it was about 30 years ago is when the conservative movement started ordaining women. Um, and now I'm I'm pleased to say that um, in my class and in other classes, it's about 50%. Um, women who are being ordained now and going into the rabbinate. So um, in terms of pushing the limits on taboos, sometimes we can't create change unless there are people who are willing to, to, um, to stand up and, and ask for more and demand more even um, to see what's possible. about how each of us can view from religious perspective how we view the organ donation. Um, we have the, uh, the verse in the Quran and it's also repeated uh, in the uh, Old Testament and where God says, and whoever saved a life of a human being as if he saved the life of all humans and the one who exhausts the life of human being or soul, as if he exhausted the life of others. Based on that understanding, yes, it is allowed, it is encouraged, it is a blessed, it's an extra credit for somebody to earn mm -hmm. by, and we talk about credit because we don't, Muslim don't have salvation. Meaning we don't believe that just because we are Muslim we will go have a free pass to, to heaven. We have to earn it in this life by the good actions and good deeds. And this is what I mean by the credit. So by don donating uh, 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 an organ, it is <coughs> as if you are helping somebody, revive somebody, give a new life to somebody in that sense. So it is something really encouraged in Islam. I have never had anyone ask me about organ donation, so I would I probably have to look in the Book of Discipline, but I think um, everybody would celebrate. Uh, this is a tradition where Jesus is, is he bringing healing in the midst of people and and sometimes modern christians get hung up on like this the technology which is different from how we engage in healing today instead of uh, acknowledging that this is uh <coughs> what makes this sort of miraculous or inspiring is that it's available and present out among everybody and that that notion of healing and its availability and its encouragement i th i think it would be I would celebrate it at the Urban Abbey, and uh, I, I can't imagine anybody who won, wouldn't, but I often disagree with other Christians, so. Um. Um, 
so Imam Jamal said it beautifully. In our in our tradition, we do have this idea that of pikuach nefesh, um, of saving a life, is really um, being far superior to almost anything else in Jewish tradition. So anything that we can do to save a life is encouraged. Um, I would say there's questions about it a lot of times in Judaism because people there's also this idea that you give your body back to God the way that um, it was given to you. And so people have questions, well, if that's the case, then what about organ donation? You're literally taking something away before we bury. Um, but all three of the, the major movements in, um, in Judaism right now, Reform, Conservative, and Orthodox, all um, celebrate organ donation and encourage it because of this idea of saving a life as being um, the, the highest um, mitzvah that you can do for somebody else. Please remember this moment when Dina agreed with me. <laughs> so just <laughs> underline, please. She already gave they, you they, they and time, they and time and place, please. please. Uh, <laughs> I will celebrate this annually. Okay, now. <laughs> Imam Jamal does not want to play rock paper scissors with me. So, um, uh, God told us in the Quran that He has created human being in the best shape, best form, the most beautiful and perfect design that is up you need to God in that way, and under that understanding, we should not attempt to change that unless somebody, he or she, had a kind of unfamiliar look or born with a something different. So we can allow some kind of plastic surgeries or some procedures to bring her to look like just everybody, not the vice versa. So under that, tattoo is a kind of uh, permanent change on that creation of God. It doesn't mean you cannot celebrate your, your beauty and your, you know, to, to, to make up yourself and decorate yourself. But to make it permanent that way is an issue. Now, piercing can be removed. It can be taken. It can be... What that? The hole. Yes. It, the hole is, is that's, that's, that's necessity. That are the tools for you to be able to use your makeup. That is not something forbidden. What is forbidden is the tattoos and the change on, on, on the way God created you. If you don't have in Christianity, just adopt what I'm saying. That's good. <laughs> trust me. I, I don't have strong trust feelings me. about Everybody tattoos either. Uh, I, I grew up in a, I, I attended a, a parachurch <laughs> ministry that I'm going to leave nameless, but uh, it was super conservative and i don't think i always realized that because i left after dinner to go to dance class and um and so then but sometimes i ended up staying and and it was very clear that like good christian humans uh didn't get tattoos they didn't smoke they didn't drink they didn't have sex like all of those things and they didn't swear i'm sure and um like it was very clear or you were going to hell and um uh I, I sometimes think that um, some of the ways that, that, that we have inherited these norms around taboos or what is um, how we behave or how we shouldn't behave really needs examination about like who benefits from these norms and who benefits from the ways that we teach certain things, especially to young people. Um, and what would have been healthier conversations uh, for us to have about understanding ourselves or understanding our well-being or understanding uh, how um, how alcohol impacts us or how uh, a tattoo is forever um, would have been really much more powerful probably conversations to to nurture young people and to to give them uh, to embolden them in making smart choices for themselves um, 
And so I, I don't have, we had an associate pastor at, at the Urban Abbey who got a sleeve tattoo while she was there. And we had an entire service um, where we, she went around and invited everyone from the bars down around the old market. And uh, we had really interesting guests that day. Uh, one site, uh, one said his name was uh, Sexy Devin and then Space Jesus. And they wanted to preach the next week. And when I uh, said, we'll think about that, they left. So, uh, so that, didn't, that didn't go great, but we did have one tattoo experience. I can't remember anybody coming into the congregation and introducing themselves as Sexy Devin or... <laughs> Uh, yes. Exciting things space happen Moses in the old, or something like that, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but I, you know, I would welcome a space Moses. Um, so he got high in the bathroom during <laughs> communion. Uh, <laughs> so there's, it's, it's an adventure. Sounds like it. <laughs> um, <laughs> in Jewish tradition, um, the in Leviticus it talks about piercings and tattoos, and it says that those. Um, that that is not allowed in Jewish tradition. So in Jewish culture, um, traditionally, um, you will not see that. A lot of people, but it's interesting because uh, as you pointed out, there's some things seem a little bit more acceptable than others, right? So ear piercing seems to be something that's a little bit different than a tattoo, which is different than a tongue piercing and all of these different things. So traditionally, like, you know, speaking as like looking at what the Torah says, it's all equal. But in society, nothing is equal, right? So everything ha comes with, like, I think what the norms are um, is, is influenced potentially by the secular society as well. Um, so what I will say is that in, 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 in traditional movements, you, might, you probably would not see either. In more liberal movements, you have people who are looking at the commandments, as I said, and trying to figure out what is the most um, beneficial and most authentic representations of how they interpret their Judaism. Um, I would say in the, in the reform movement, even, there are a lot of people who look at tattoos specifically, and um, instead of looking at it as a marking on your body that is not the way that God gave it to you, um, they look at this other commandment that says, you know, that we are supposed to adorn ourselves and we are supposed to celebrate our bodies and that we are supposed to, um, you know, there's a, a commandment called hidur mitzvah, which means to um, beautify or, um, in, in, you know, don't just do a mitzvah, but do it in a way that is beautiful and meaningful. And so if we are supposed to appreciate the bodies that God gave us as vessels for our souls, why wouldn't we beautify those vessels for our souls? And so there are people who use their bodies um, in order to decorate them in some ways. And so they see tattoos as a potential avenue for that. Um, and so you will even see people that have quote unquote Jewish tattoos, whatever that means, with Hebrew, with um, Torah verses on them with other things because they're looking at it um, at, in a different perspective. You and then you. Uh, we have about 10 minutes left, so if there's other questions. Okay, so I need to get settled in uh, space. So, all right, I've been taking an exploring Judaism class at the JCC, and we had this discussion about tattoos. It's very hard for me to settle a never, <laughs> like I said, there's a lot of different um, opinions depending on where you go. So I, I, I would not say that it's never been true. Like, I'm sure there probably are communities where that has been true, depending on how they interpret the commandments, because Jewish communities exist all over the world for centuries. And so it might be that... Um, that there, ha that there have been. I would say most of what we know is that that's not a prohibition um, in, in the modern world, especially, by the way, after World War II, because so many people in World War II were tattooed with numbers in concentration camps, um, and they certainly were able to be buried in Jewish cemeteries. So um, it's more of a prohibition in, or a taboo, I would say, um, in, in the traditional world. And so it may have been in other parts of the world at different times that that was prohibited, but I can't speak to that really. What I can say is that in the modern world, um, I don't know of people who are prohibited from being buried in Jewish cemeteries because of tattoos. Thank you. 
Okay. Um, <laughs> so uh, the question would be um, that there's this sense of, of justification by faith, like this grace that is given, and that it's not about works, and that the prohibitions may not uh, sort of matter or impact uh, this sense of salvation. Does that capture your question or your? Um, so that there's uh, probably at the the Protestant Reformation, you have like a great debate around uh, works righteousness. It's sometimes called, and and then uh, the United States has a sort of a history of, of this kind of anti-Catholic sentiment that that sort of uh, leans into. I think how some modern Protestants and fundamentalists um, have inherited the Christian narrative, and um, and so in in my tradition, uh, we talk about grace in three ways: this prevenient grace, this sense that God is already there, God is already in everybody, God is already at work. And so in our in our sense of baptism, it's not like get out of hell free. It's um, or this baby was so bad, but. Um, it is this kind of outside ritual that acknowledges God's inward presence and that we're a family. Um, and then this sense of justifying grace would be this awakening moment, this turning moment. Um, but there's also, I think, in most traditions, this sense that it should matter and that you should be visibly active in love and compassion. And that, so it's not... Uh, sort of this sense of salvation is like, I said the right thing and I'm in. Uh, and certainly uh, that's sort of been taken that way in other places. Like uh, you have some early uh, powerful people who are converting to Christianity, like uh, Constantine, right? Uh, a great Christian. Uh, he, he doesn't get baptized until the, like close to his death because he needs it to wash away all of his sins or something to that effect. Um, but I, I think that that probably a deeper faith practice would say that that the way you live and the way you work matters. And in the Methodist tradition, it's this the third sort of grace is called uh, sanctifying grace, and and it would be this kind of sense of practice that we practice everything else in our life. We practice soccer and ballet and musical instruments. Why would we not be intentional about how we practice our faith? And that. Um, to go uh, earlier into history, like Constantine and, sh uh, s sorry, Charlemagne, a different C, uh, you have this shift in Christian theology. Sorry, just one more minute. Uh, you have this shift in Christian theology uh, that is away from like a realized uh, here and now salvation to a, a, a dominant sense of an afterlife salvation purely afterlife, which is really good for powerful people to keep their power if you are only focused on what happens next instead of uh, in the Jesus prayer that he would have taught everybody to say again and again, earth as it is in heaven, that, that salvation is here, salvation is now as well, and that there's a realized aspect to salvation and to the way we practice life together and the way we live life together. And that, um, and so, that, I think, gets into the taboos of how, how you practice life gets you to thinking about, well, is that, the, is that a life-giving practice or is that a practice that deals harm in some way to myself or someone else? Um, sorry, that was a lot in... It was a big question. Okay. <laughs> uh, I don't mean to pick on you, Mom Jamal, but... No, it's my turn. See, see, they already uh, spoke. Uh, so this question has to be specifically for me. Yeah. You are not allowed to speak, and you give me, you give me double dose, okay? You give, you Sorry. give your chair, you give your chair, okay? <laughs> oh man, that's but you are sitting up there with two women. Um, are, is there a prohibition against female clergy in Islam? It depends on how we define female clergy. We don't have a clergy system. All right, we have the most educated can be imam. We have a teaching about imam long time ago, I mean, since the beginning up until now, it used to be a male. If we define the imam's position and summarize it into a hundred step, 
it can be shared with the woman one by one except one out of those hundred which is leading the mixed prayer when you have male and female. Everything else that can be related to the imam, the male imam can be done by a female leader, except that one. So if we are talking about this specific one, I don't know where we want to go with that, you know, what, what the sense. A, uh, a female can be imam in a female group, but when we have male and female, and when we have our uh, physical prayer that you have seen some of us doing, it is for practicality, it is for uh, focus in their prayer, it is for uh, decency when we are doing those bowing down and prostration. It is for that only reason, has nothing to do about uh, who is better than others. I graduated from Islamic uh, uh, seminary, my wife graduated from the same. And she is helping and she can be uh, a, a great imam, but you can ask her, would you like to, be, to lead the prayer for that specific 1%? So this is what we are talking about. Unfortunately, people misunderstand Islam by saying, no, Islam does not allow uh, uh, female clergy. What kind of that position you are looking for? All right, just to be fair. Yep. You're welcome. How, how many seconds I still have? <laughs> Five. Um, <laughs> okay, so I have one closing question for all of you. Um, what would a world, a society without taboo look like for your tradition? And you don't want me, you don't want me to speak politics? It's a mess. It's a mess. For me, as a Muslim, as a moderate Muslim, I, we, have, we don't have reform movement. So as a Muslim who understands his religion properly, I enjoy learning and following our taboos. I never felt or practiced, and maybe because I'm imam, uh, I never felt that it is a problem. It is hardship. It is, it is restriction you know, to follow my taboos uh, in that way. So I feel more disciplined, more uh, closer to God, and better human being by following my taboos because I believe what God said so he knows better than us what to do. Yep. I agree. Uh, <laughs> Please repeat that. And <laughs> Would you put the camera on her, please? I agree, I agree. Okay. I, I, I don't know. I mean, I don't have a strong uh, feeling of restriction about taboos. Uh, I mean, um, but as I, as I think about it, uh, that we've, I've, I've been in places where I've been able to learn or study or relearn uh, or explore uh, in ways that have allowed me to, to feel open or to, to kind of grow in understanding or to not kind of hold on to a faith that was so rigid or, or um, uh, kind of limiting myself or others. Uh, for me, a, like a dream would be if everybody had space to feel empowered, to be who they are, uh, to be well fed and go to bed safe and warm, and that we would be able to be in hard conversations with one another uh, without hurting or wounding, but really being open and listening. And, um, and so, um, that I, that's all. So, yeah. um, you know, I think that the question that you pose is really about boundaries in many ways, right? So um, that's something that we, we talk about a lot in, in our in our world and, and in Judaism is where are the boundaries because boundaries can be both positive and affirming um, but also exclusionary so how can we you know in terms of like should there be taboos or not I'm not sure I know the answer to that question but what I what I will say is that um, what I what I love about um, my understanding of Judaism is that I'm allowed to look at these taboos I'm allowed to look at the laws um, and I'm encouraged to learn as much as I can about where they came from and why, and then decide if they're meaningful to my life. 
um, and so and make decisions based on how I interpret those laws. And so I would say where, you know, like sometimes I look at them and I say, that makes no sense for my life. I don't agree with that. And, and that's why I'm a reformed Jew, by the way. Um, but then there are other practices like kashrut that many would say that other people look at and say, I don't get meaning from that. That's not part of my life. I'm not going to observe that mitzvah. But that, you know, I actually do find meaning from those boundaries, from saying that I'm not going to eat pork, I'm not going to eat shellfish, because um, it gives me um, the ability to reflect on what I'm consuming, how my body is working, what, um, and have a relationship with God and also the rest of the community and be intentional about those things. So I think for me, it's really about looking at the different, what we call taboos and saying, are they affirming my life and are they empowering me to be the best um, version of myself that I can be? And if, if the answer is no, then you leave it. But if the answer is yes, then you take that practice and you make it your own. If we could just give a round of applause for our <laughs> panelists.